Now we live in a day and age that's all about comfort and, and all about the lack of any kind of adversity. In fact, we order our lives around it. And yet what we see in the book of James is that adversity is actually a gateway into deeper joy. Here's the sentence, all right? Trials will come, count them all as joy because God is good. There's our sentence, I wanna to try to defend that sentence. So I'm taking these 16 verses, I'm distilling them into a sentence. Trials will come, not if, they will come. And we count it all as joy because God is good. That's my sentence, I'll stand there, anchor there, argue there, I wanna set out now to prove it. Now, uh, when you start talking about trials and struggles and difficulties, here, he, here's what uh, I love, and I've said this a thousand times, I love the griminess of the Bible. I, I just love it. Uh, he, he doesn't say, um, if you experience trials or if you happen to be the small portion of people that are gonna go through trials and struggles, that's not what he does because that's not the reality we live in. It's not if, it is when when you face trials of various kinds. And if you're like, well, what does he mean by trial? Is he talking about difficult marriage? Well, that would fit in the category of various. <laughs> See, that's what I love about, he just put various there. Well, are you talking about being sick? That would be a variety of trial. Well, what about difficulty with, I've got a kid who's acting a fool, he's wilding out, would that be there? That is various, right? It's all, there's no wiggle room here if you're enduring a trial, there it is. Now, a um, couple of things so we can just talk here. Some of you, this conversation will not be some point about things that are coming in the future. You're in it right now, and it's awful. And yet here, here we are going, no, 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 trials will come. And so for some of us, this idea of trials, it's not ethereal, it's right now. And others of us, because it's if, not when, that storm is building somewhere out there in the ocean. The wave is moving closer and closer to us. In fact, the phone could ring this week, could ring two weeks from now, our day of trial will come. And, and if I'm being real honest and really chipper, it's not just the day of trial, it's the days, plural. You don't just survive one and go, man, glad I got that one behind me. Just spirit-sprinkled joy for the rest of my life. That, that's not what happens. It's mountaintops and valleys, is it not? And, and that's what I love about the Bible. The Bible meets us in the world that we are in. It's not fantasy. There's no picture of utopia in the here and now for us. There is one coming, but the Bible is clear that you and I are in the space between the already and the not yet, that Christ has died and ushered in the coming of the kingdom, and it is not yet consummated. It'll be consummated at the return of Christ. So in the meantime, we're in this space between, and what we see in the Bible is that our world is not sterile. It's grimy. People get sick. They die, they are betrayed, they are wrongly accused, they grow weary, they lose heart, but by the grace of God, others endure. Their legs are strengthened, their heart is inflamed. They hold fast and have a type of joy that transcends some of those horrific circumstances uh, imaginable. Now, um, as I've gotten older, uh, I start paying more attention to those uh, whose legs were strengthened in the day of the storm. Now, when you're young, you don't pay attention to that. You like the battle scenes where the, the mouths of lions are shut and David cuts off the head of the giant. When you're 20, you love that stuff because you hadn't bled yet. You hadn't bled. You hadn't put anybody in the ground yet. You, you haven't got close enough to the suffering of the world, most of you. But man, at, at 40, I'm seeing a, a brother get his, he survives the lion, but he left his arm with the lion. And I'm dialed into that story because that's probably been more my experience than I got away with all my limbs. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds. So not only am I gonna endure trial, but the command of God is that I have joy in them, right? So how is that possible? All right, two things. One, um, that there are two ways that we need to view trials, those of us who are in Christ, and there are two fights that we have to know that we're in. Number one, uh, the Christian views trials as a pathway to maturity. Look at uh, verse three. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, um, if we take this conversation out of the spiritual world and we just set it into your life experience, how have you matured? How have you grown? 
Have you not matured and grown by falling and failing and stumbling? Has growth into maturity for you physically, intellectually, and as a person come because everything has always gone your way and everything you chose to do was spot on right and perfect? No, I don't need you to answer. No, you learned by failing. You learned by scraping your knees. You learned by thinking you're right only to realize you were wrong. That's how all of us have matured. Do we really believe then that the way we mature spiritually is completely different? That instead, um, God just sprinkles us with pixie dust and we just fly. That's all it is. We just believe pixie dust and we're off. But, well, no, and, and we know that can't be true either. And, and I know some of us wish this, all that, that I would just be quiet about this because we want to believe that we can get maturity without trials. We want to believe that we can mature without them. And so when I come across um, friends, brothers, sisters who struggle a bit with anxiety on, oh my gosh, trials are coming. That wave out there is freaking me out, Chandler. I, I don't know why I even came here today. I should have gone to a movie. I send usually this quote from A.W. Tozer. It's one of my favorites. The fallow or the unplanted field is smug, contented, protected from the shock of the plow and the agitation of the harrow or being broken up. Such a field as it lies year after year becomes a familiar landmark to the crow and the blue jay. Safe and undisturbed, it sprawls lazily in the sunshine, the picture of sleepy contentment. And everybody's like, there we go, okay. I would like, that sounds, oh wait, I'm laying lazily in sleepy contentment? Yes, please. Is that your point? Finish there, Pastor, just pray and get us out of here. But that's not the world we live in. But it is paying a terrible price for its tranquility. Never does it see the miracle of growth. Never does it feel the motions of mounting life, nor see the wonders of bursting seed, nor the beauty of ripening grain. Fruit it can never know because it's afraid of the plow and the harrow. In direct opposite to this, the cultivated field has yielded itself to the adventure of living. The protecting fence has opened to admit the plow, and the plow has come as plows always come. Practical cruel, businesslike, and in a hurry. Peace has been shattered by the shouting farmer and the rattle of the machinery. The field has felt the travail of change. It has been upset, turned over, bruised, and broken, but its rewards come hard upon its labors. The seed shoots up into the daylight, its miracle of life, curious, exploring the new world above it. All over the field, the hand of God is at work in the age-old and ever-renewed service of creation. New things are born to grow, mature, and consummate. The grand prophecy latent in the seed when it entered the ground. One of my favorite sentences ever written. Nature's wonders follow the plow. And we know this, right? Like like we know if you're in the middle of trial, maybe you forgot it. But those of us who have been through the dark night of the soul and come out on the other side, we see how it shaped us, how we interact with our friends, how we walk alongside our wives, the patience we're able to extend, the way we're able to see what is important and what's not important. It's the plow that shows you that. It's not pixie dust. It's the plow. And so as anxious as we are, about the wave that is coming. My my hope is that these lenses will serve as as a type of seawall, a break against that wave when it lands. The trial is a path to maturity. But that's not the only lens we need to wear. Look at verse five. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. This piece has to be there. So so the first piece is uh, I'm on a path to being matured by God and then the second second part of the lens is that trials help me be consciously aware of my need for God. Trials help me be consciously aware of my need for God. So let me give you just a bit of insight into all of our little insidious hearts. When everything's going great and everything's like you want it, you don't have your mind and heart set on the Lord at all. In fact, you think you're doing really well. It's you. You're the one that established the greatness that is today. But let everything, so if everything goes right, you did it. But if everything goes wrong, it's God who did it and it's not fair. I mean, that's just a little peek into our insidious hearts. 
If everything's going great, I don't need God, I've got this thing, I'm nailing it. Everything goes bad. Can't believe this, God. This is unfair. I mean, that's our little dark hearts. It's how we operate. And so this says, on this day where trials, we're trying to walk and consider all things joy in this trial. And let, me, let us ask for wisdom. Help me understand this. I don't get this, God. Let him ask for wisdom and the Lord will respond. And then that leads me to the fight. Okay, so you've got new lenses on. Here we are, believers in Christ. We're enduring a trial. We're going, okay, I don't quite fully understand it, but here's the deal. I know that God is maturing me. He's chiseling me. He's shaping me. He's forming in me more and more and more into the image of the Son. I know I'm praying more. I'm clinging to him more. I'm getting what I really need, not really what I want, but what I need. See, if I get Christ and lose everything else, I've got everything. And if I get everything and don't have Christ, I've lost everything. So this is not a bad trait. So that's where we are. And then the fights come. Look at this next text. Such a difficult text. But let him ask, let him ask for wisdom, consciously hold fast to God, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. That seems heavy-handed, man. Like, here's what just happened. I always want to be honest about what's going on in the text. God says, you're confused. Ask me, but don't doubt, because if you doubt, you shouldn't expect anything from me. You're a double-minded man. Well, oh, golly. What I, you just told me if I was doubting to ask. How could you now say, if I'm doubting, don't ask? So what are we supposed to do with that, right? So let, let's try to explain what's happening here. There's two prayers in this little text. One is, grant me wisdom, and the other is, increase my faith, kill my doubts. Now, when I'm thinking about this balance between faith and doubt and this great fight that we can get in, my mind and heart always goes to Mark chapter 9. And they brought the boy to Jesus. And when the spirit, the demon, saw him, immediately it convulsed and the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And the father said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Listen to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Verse 24, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe what? Help my unbelief. Now, is there anyone in this room that can't say amen to that sentence? I believe, but help my unbelief. I, I believe that you're good. I believe that you're God. I believe that you've got this, but help me because part of me doesn't. Anyone? Yes. Like this could, you'd get this tattooed on your forearm. It wouldn't be a waste. I believe. Help my unbelief. So the question then is that enough faith for the mercy and grace of God to work on our behalf? Well, let's find out. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. There's no, there's no um, duplicitous battle going on in the universe. No demons ever argue with Jesus. Go, not today. And then there's this big fight between them. He's like, get out, convulsing, he's out. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy looked like a corpse so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. So here's the good news. The good news is in that place where we're fighting doubt, this spot where we're like, I believe, help my unbelief. This spot where we're going, I believe, but I'm struggling to hang on to that belief that God steps into that space and that faith is that mustard seed of faith that puts the Lord to work in our lives. Look at me. I don't know what version of Christianity you've bought into, but there's really only one biblical version of it. And, and let me catch you up on just a little bit of that. Uh, the little bit of that that you really need to embrace and know is there's not a day coming where you're not gonna have to wrestle with your flesh and get to this place where trials will not eventually wear you down to the point of wrestling with doubt at least at this level, all right? Life has a way of pounding on you in a Genesis 3 world, and you shouldn't feel guilt or shame about wrestling with doubt. Jesus healed his son. 
He cast out the demon. This brother was like, if you can. And then Jesus was like, if I can. I can do anything for someone who believes. I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe, but I don't believe. Okay, boom, healed him. Let that encourage you. I'm open around about, well, I just struggle. Yeah. Who told you you wouldn't? Like, where did you get that? Of course you do. But God honors the fight. The double-minded man is the mind like, uh, uh, not gonna work, he's not gonna help me, he's not gonna, you're not even crying out to God for help because you believe that he won't help you. That's the double-minded man, giving lip service to God, pretending to be all put together when you're not. What do you feel like your testimony needs to be? Doing great, nailing it. Yeah, marriage is a train wreck, well, but we're fine. <laughs> House on fire behind you like a Denzel Washington movie. <laughs> it's fine, don't worry about it. What's that? Oh, don't worry about it. Now, we'll put that out, we're good. Good. Matt was funny today, wasn't he? He was so funny. I love that guy. Stop. You got to quit pretending. The sermon's going to go longer than it should. In the fight of doubt. Now, here's the second fight, because some of us are going to really duke it out with doubt, but there's another one that we fight with in the midst of trials. Look there in verse 9. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Okay, here, here's the second fight. The first fight is doubt. Are you good? Are you here? Will you help? The second fight is the fight of comparison. Um, a sociological study that rolled out this week, in fact, most of the major kind of secular media outlets picked it up. Uh, it was a pretty big study on Instagram and its effects on us. And, and here's the conclusion, not by Christians. The conclusion is Instagram leads to depression. All right? Instagram leads to depression. And, and here's why. Here's why. Because if we could just paint the picture like it actually happens. You just finished blowing through a whole season of something on Netflix. You have not got out of your pajama pants that day. You crawl into bed and you grab your phone and you start scrolling through your Instagram account. And here's what you find. Everybody's marriage is awesome. And their kids are incredible. And they're just counting money. And they don't struggle, and there's no pain, and there's no sorrow. And here you are in your trial, ate a whole gallon of ice cream, watching a series on Netflix, you already, and you start to resent them. And you start to grow in anger against them. Really, me, Lord? I'm enduring this trial? What about them? And in your trial, your insidious, wicked heart will be exposed. And comparison is how it plays itself out. So just so you know, I'm not dogging you, I'm dogging us. Um, after my diagnosis with brain cancer, it happened around Christmas, and um, I, I was in a dark place. So no cape on me, I was in a dark place. Everything I saw was lost. I couldn't look at my daughters because I would think, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna get to walk them down the aisle. I'm not gonna get to na help them navigate through the travails of being a teenage girl in this depraved day. I couldn't look at my son because I thought, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna be able to encourage him to become the man that he's, and everywhere I looked, I just saw loss. And it was that time of year where everybody sends you a picture of their family and dog on a card. And so what Lauren does with those is she puts them all over our mantle and then she puts them on our Christmas trees. And um, I'm sitting on the couch, Lauren and the kids were gone and I'm um, sitting there just feeling sorry for myself and um, just really running through everything I was losing and the fact that really the next two years of my life they're gonna poison me and radiate me and then I was just gonna melt away and everything that was strong about me and fun about me is gone forever. That's where I was, that's where my heart was. Just don't wanna ever bull you. That's where my heart was, it was dark. And I look up and on my mantle is a picture of this family and the man in that family is a serial adulterer, a coward and a fool. And I thought, your pastor thought, really God? Me? This happening to me? I've done nothing but serve you. I've done nothing but have my life wrung out for your glory. I've done nothing but make much of your name and your renown. And this clown gets health? 
And I'll tell you what, man. The Holy Spirit did not wait long to punch me in the soul. And he very quickly stepped in. Luke 15 flooded my mind, and I realized I'm like the older brother complaining outside. And the Holy Spirit pressed upon my heart. So he can't be a victorious story of my salvation and reconciliation? Only you can? Plus, brother, I think you might be elevating your own worth here. You really think that, um, that, that my plan is contingent upon you being here? Brother, you're going to go on the ground, come on home to me, and I'm just going to keep moving. I, I've hinged nothing on you, sweet friend. <laughs> and it was a really beautiful, awful moment. And I'm grateful to God for it. When we're enduring trials, we become hyper aware of the prettiness of other people's lives and we begin to resent them. And, and James here, via the power of the Holy Spirit, is going, no, 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 no. It's all level in the end. Don't, don't believe the Instagram hype. Everyone endures trials. Everyone struggles. We'll have seasons in which the sky is clear and we'll have seasons in which uh, they're cloudy. Uh, I am leading you into maturity. I am showing you you need me. And then in the middle of this, we're gonna need some encouragement. So the Holy Spirit knows that we're gonna need that. And so verse 13 is here. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So here's the argumentation as it flows down. We need to see our trials as paths to maturity. We need to understand and the trials make us consciously aware that we need God, the only thing we actually really need. And then on top of that, be careful because you're going to have to duke it out with doubt and it's going to be a fight. It's like a round 12, round 13, hang in there and keep swinging type of fight. And if you're not careful, comparison will tag team jump in there. And if you're not careful, you're going to be tempted and drawn, incited by your own flesh to betray God's invitation to maturity and getting what you actually need. And that will lead to death. Hang in there. I've got you. And so from there, then James does what he must do in this moment, and that's to turn our eyes onto the nature and character of God. Look at verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Don't be deceived. Don't be fooled. You're in the midst of a trial. Don't be deceived. Don't be fooled. Your flesh is going to incite you. You're going to want to believe that God isn't good. You're going to wrestle with comparison and doubt. Don't be deceived. Don't be tricked. And then he moves on with this beautiful reminder. Everything good and perfect has come down from the Father of lights. One of the greatest anchors for your soul in the trials that come, regardless of the intensity of those trials, is the greater your knowledge of the goodness and grace of God on your life, especially in the world of just common grace, the more likely you are to praise him in the storm. So what do I mean by the gifts of common grace? Um, my guess is that you're going to eat lunch and dinner today in a way that most of the world will not. And we don't think about it that way. We just think it's lunchtime. Let's just go eat something that in most parts of the world would be seen as an epic feast fit only for holidays because of its great cost. But for us, it's just something we threw in the crock pot. That, that's a blessing. It came down from the Father of Lights. You, you got any friends? That came down from the Father of Lights. Have you found a wife or a husband? That came down from the Father of Lights. You're like, well, you don't know my spouse. Trust me, came down from the Father of Lights. Might be a path to maturity. Might be you needing consciously to know you need God, but a gift from God on high. You need to keep going. Got any money in your pocket? Came down from the Father of Lights. Can you see, smell, hear? Came down from the, you want to meet people who can't? They're all over there at our church. Everything good has come down 
from above the Father of lights. The, the other thing that we see in what we just read is there's no variation, no change in him. So I preach this all the time during communion. Let me do it now. God knew what he was buying on the cross. He knew what he was getting with you. He, he's not changing his mind. He's not watching you screw up now and huddling up. Hey, um, did we write anything in the Bible about having to keep these guys once we got them? Is there a return policy? No return po Are you sure? Spirit, that's in the Bible? Ah, me, right? No, there, there's no, he knew all of your failings, all of your shortcomings, they, they, he's imparted future grace. Listen, if you think, look right at me, if you think you disgust God, let me talk to you. All the disgust God has for you was poured out in the brutal death of Jesus Christ on that cross. So it was disgusting, all right. Look to the cross. It's grimy and blood and agony and sorrow and loss. But all of his disgust towards you, Christian, is gone. You feel wonky and unstable? Feel like you're constantly tossed about? Does that bother God? Look to the cross. He absorbed it all. The reason Paul can so clearly say in Romans 8 there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ is because the debt has been paid in full. So as I so often tell you, please get over yourself. Are you serious? I'm so terrible. Yeah, look to the cross. You're that terrible. But now, all that was due for that disgusting, terrible stuff has been handled. It, it's been handled. There's no shadow of turning. There's no variation. He's not looking at you today and going, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. 18, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creature. Now, this is where things get staggering. So if you're like, oh, I probably disgust him. I fall short. Can't believe I wrestle with doubt. Here's how James ends this whole idea of the day of trial in our fight of doubt, in our fight with comparison. James wants to remind us of this. God chose you. This was God's idea. It was of his own will that he called you to himself. That God, looking out on the horizon of human history, said, I'm gonna make that one a part of my family. I'm gonna call him my own. I'm gonna bring her into my own family, and I'm gonna bestow upon them all the riches of my glory. Oh, he chose you. Rest. This past week um, on Wednesday, um, we had Dr. Rick Rigsby come in and speak to our staff, had all 130 from all our campuses come and meet for a store at the Highland Village campus. And Rick Rigsby is a longtime professor at Texas a and University. And he, um, he um, had, it was, his classes were very hard to get into. And he's uh, an, an expert on civil rights and the history of the black church. And what I wanted him to do to increase our ethnic IQ uh, among our staff is come in and tell us the role, the formation of the black church and its role in the civil rights movement on into today. And so Rigsby came in for like four, five hours, just lined it out for us. And, and one of the things he said is early on in the black church, not educated, illiterate, they would grab hold of these kind of central truths and, and it wasn't a lot of depth, but there was a lot of rhythm and they would just start to kick around and engage with one another over a single truth that held them together. And that single truth that they rallied around for decades, illiterate, no exegetical skills, no uh, understanding of biblical theology at the high level, but here's what they knew. If God is for us, if God is for us, who could be against us? If God is for us, justice will come. If God is for us, this will be okay. If God is for us, we'll make it through. If God is for us, we will endure. And they would get together and for hours, quietly and then loudly, they would celebrate God is for us. And that's all we're saying today. Trials will come. Consider it all joy. God is good. He is for you. And I'm not saying your trial's not awful. I'm a pastor. I will, I'll give you awful upon awful. But you haven't been betrayed. 
And I would argue that it's not punitive and you can scream and cry and shake your fist at the heavens. And I would argue that if you are in him, if you are a believer in Christ, there's the removing of something that might hurt you for the gift of something that will bring nothing but ever-increasing joy. That's not a bad trade. It might be a painful one, but not a bad one.